One Network News with John Hawksby and Kathy Campbell. Tonight, the United States sets a January deadline to end the Gulf stalemate and get Iraq out of Kuwait. The government calls a conference to come up with a cure for the economy. And in Earthwatch, we investigate why our native trees are dying. Good evening. The United States tonight set a deadline of January the 1st for Iraq to get out of Kuwait. A draft resolution will be put to the United Nations later this week. It will propose that if the New Year deadline is ignored, then the UN should support use of force against Iraq. Tonight, British Foreign Secretary Douglas Hurd said the situation in the Gulf was entering a critical phase. Ben Brown reports. The UN Security Council has already passed 10 resolutions against Iraq, but this one may be the most important. It's the first to set Saddam Hussein a deadline for getting out of Kuwait. America's Secretary of State James Baker has spent the last few weeks seeking support for such a resolution, and his dedicated diplomacy seems to have paid off. The Soviet Union and China will almost certainly go along with this ultimatum to Iraq. By January the 1st, deadline day, the United States will have about 400,000 troops in the Gulf. Even so, it will not necessarily attack then if Iraq is still not withdrawn. But this resolution is designed to convince Saddam Hussein that his time is running out and that America is not bluffing. President Bush, at the end of his recent tour to the region, said he's tired of the status quo and of the continuing occupation. But by giving Saddam at least another month, the UN resolution does go some way to meeting Soviet concerns that a little more time should be allowed for a peaceful resolution. The United States says it already has authority under the UN's charter to use force, but it's been anxious to keep the coalition against Saddam united, and it sees a fresh resolution as the best way of doing that. America was anxious to push it through as soon as possible. Next week, its chairmanship of the Security Council goes to Yemen, which is still friendly to Iraq and which would probably have made life more difficult. Back home, the government has extended a wide-ranging invitation to an economic conference on Friday. Prime Minister Jim Bolger has called in the country's top businessmen, bankers and farmers for advice on improving the economy. Here's political reporter Chris Ryan. Jim Bolger's election night victory speech featured what he calls the politics of inclusion. That pledge gets its first big test this Friday in the Beehive. Sector chiefs from agriculture to tourism will be asked to do their bit to restore growth to the economy. What we are doing, in fact, is not being so arrogant as to say that all the answers reside in the Beehive. We, in fact, and signalled this many times, want to work with the private sector who create the jobs, generate the growth, earn the money. This business doesn't, this building doesn't earn any money, it spends it. I want to talk with ones that earn it. The conference says Mr Bolger will not be one where his government simply explains what it wants to do. Each sector attending, whether from banking or manufacturing, will have to say what they can do. One notable exception, however, is Governor of the Reserve Bank Don Brash. Hugh Fletcher and Auckland academic Colin Maiden will address the meeting, but the emphasis is on sectors saying how they can help. Invited them to put on a, a thousand word um, submission what their sector can do to assist the country to uh, get up and grow and to show enterprise. It's so often been my experience that uh, uh, sector groups will tell the world what others should do to enable enterprise to flourish or growth to be achieved, but I want them to focus them, their attention and their energy in their opening papers on what their sector can do. Unions are invited, but their input is now far less critical than under the growth agreement. This meeting is an attempt by Mr Bolger to replace the growth agreement with something new. Chris Ryan, One Network News. An inquiry has been launched into the troubled Bank of New Zealand. The bank's biggest shareholder, Finance Minister Ruth Richardson, says the investigation will look at the way the BNZ makes and manages its loans, but will not be a witch hunt. Here's economics reporter Ewart Barnsley. The BNZ has a multi-million dollar headache of bad debts. Three weeks ago, the government started its cure by writing out a cheque for $620 million to rescue the bank. Now the biggest shareholder is demanding an inquiry of the BNZ's operations. The concentration is, is in the engine room and is designed to lift the commercial performance of the bank. 
The review of the bank's engine room includes the BNZ's credit management, its information and reporting systems and the management of bad loans. Missing from the inquiry is the hunt for those responsible for the BNZ's huge losses. They are the centre of a separate investigation. I'm saying that I am taking legal advice uh, and that if there is a price to be paid by those who are found to be culpable or responsible, it will be paid. Although the operational review may not be a witch hunt, although the review has been welcomed by the bank itself, it still highlights tensions between the BNZ and a government unhappy with the performance of the bank's board. Ewart Barnsley, One Network News. Air New Zealand has announced a $26 million loss for the six-month period to September. This compares with a $19 million profit for the same period last year. The loss was due to costs associated with the axing of the Fokker Friendship Fleet and soaring fuel bills. The South Island's largest evening newspaper sacked half of its staff today. Ninety people lost their jobs, but the Christchurch Star's managers say the newspaper will still be published six days a week. David Jamison reports. Mixed reactions to this afternoon's cuts at the Star. For some employees, relief. For others, resignation. With Christmas only a month away, few of the 90 were in a mood to share the view of long-time education reporter John Brown. Oh, maybe, it's, maybe when one door closes, another one opens. But today, for most departments, the only doors opening have been the exits. Evening papers are finding the going tough, and the star is no exception. Already this year, it's shifted buildings, introduced new technology, launched a Sunday edition, and laid off some staff. It's believed falling circulation, a drop in advertising and increased costs caused the latest cuts. It is the death of the newspaper and that's what makes me really very, very sad. We just feel it's a recipe for total and utter disaster. But not so, according to management. The paper will continue to be published, albeit smaller and with another new look. David Jameson, One Network News. And across the Tasman tonight, the television network Channel 10 is to sack 300 of its staff to stave off financial disaster. The channel's been in receivership since September and is estimated to be losing around $2 million a week. The man accused of double murder in the Swedish tourist trial today took the stand and gave evidence. David Wayne Tamahiri faced the jury and told the court he did not kill Heidi Parkinen and Urban Hoglin. Pauline Hudson reports. Supporters from David Tamahiri's family were among people who packed the public gallery today for the opening of the defence case. They came to hear David Tamahiri's side of the story. He was called as a witness today, the defence saying he wanted to give evidence. Tamahiri testified today that key Crown evidence from three prison inmates had been untrue. He said he never told the cellmates he met, raped and murdered the Swedes. Asked by his counsel today, did you kill the Swedish couple? Tamahiri replied, no. And to another question, did you ever meet either of them? Tamahiri also replied, no. And when his counsel Colin Nicholson asked if he knew where the bodies were, again Tamahiri said, no. Nicholson suggested in his opening today Heidi Parkinen and Urban Hoglin may have died in a tragic accident and not through foul play. He said the search for the couple's bodies had failings and some of the tracks they'd talked of tramping on had not been adequately searched. The defence is calling 11 witnesses as part of its case. Tamahiri will be in the stand again tomorrow as the Crown continues its cross-examination. Pauline Hudson, One Network News. Tensions are high in the east coast hamlet of Ruatoria after a series of overnight fires. Several batches and caravans belonging to Rastafarian squatters were set alight. They were on property belonging to a Maori Land Corporation. It had been trying for some time to evict the Rastafarians. Last week the squatters clashed with police and it's understood they had gone to stay at a local marae. Sistel faces a serious fire alert tonight after bushfires encircled the city overnight. Soaring temperatures and dry grass are causing the trouble. The biggest fire at Sydney Harbour's National Park couldn't have started at a worse time with hundreds of people crowding some of Sydney's most popular beaches. Fifteen people were rescued by helicopter in what is already proving a bad bushfire season. Israel has demanded Egypt tighten border security after at least 10 Israelis were killed in cross-border attacks during the weekend. In the worst incident, an Arab gunman opened fire on a bus, killing the driver and injuring 24 passengers. 
Earlier, the gunman shot dead the drivers of three Israeli army vehicles on a remote desert road. In Poland, it appears Solidarity leader Lech Wałęsa has failed to win the presidential election outright and will have to face a runoff. Computer projections indicate Wałęsa has taken almost 41% of the vote but needed more than 50% to win. Margaret Thatcher, soon to relinquish the reins of power, is preparing to move out of number 10 later today after occupying the residence for 11 years. And Britain's divided Conservative Party has just one day left to decide which of three men can pull the party together and keep the Tories in government. After holding strategy meetings first thing this morning, the contenders will be trying to meet or speak to as many as possible of those MPs who've yet to commit themselves. After a weekend performing for the cameras, Douglas Hurd knows he's not in front, but denies that he's trailing badly. And in an effort to regain some of the initiative, he's called for a reform of the way both Parliament and Whitehall are run. Mr Hurd acknowledges that he's running behind John Major, the man with whom he says he's in friendly competition. Mr Major's campaign team says he now has a majority of the Cabinet and over 150 MPs behind him, as well as most of the party workers in the constituencies. There's even talk of an outright victory in tomorrow's second ballot. I think it would be uh, in everyone's interest for it to be settled on the second ballot. The sooner it's settled and the sooner we can get back to uh, a more normal way of life, I think the better for everyone. Michael Heseltine might well agree with that, although with him as the victor. His backers say the Chancellor's claims are inflated, but all the candidates are now talking up their support to try to ensure that they, and not their rivals, have the all-important momentum. Thank you very much. <laughs> but it's the 372 Conservative MPs who will decide who will be moving into Downing Street this week. The removal men will be taking away many of Mrs Thatcher's belongings later today, but if tomorrow's vote is inconclusive, she won't finally have to move out until after the third ballot on Thursday. Coming up, what ails our native trees? Tonight, Earthwatch reports on the stress of modern living for New Zealand's age-old plant life. We've had, say, a thousand years of people and 150 years of wild animals and farming and that sort of thing. And it's all sort of coming to fruition. Life in the fast lane, coping with the hustle and bustle of modern living, it can all add up to a stressful existence. While that may seem a load for humans to bear, there's growing concern that parallel burdens are weighing too heavily on New Zealand's plant life. In tonight's Earth Watch, Peter Stevens reports on the possible stress signs emerging on New Zealand's green horizon. Strange and disturbing patterns are appearing on New Zealand's landscape. Some scientists, while hunting the mysterious cabbage tree killer, are finding possible evidence of sickness striking other areas of New Zealand's flora. There are a lot of native plants that are in bad shape, like um, the Pudakawa, for instance, or the Rata. In some places, Tortora. In this case, uh, the cabbage tree. What scientists like Philip Simpson have to find out is whether it's natural ageing in New Zealand's native plant life or quite literally the stress of modern living which may be throwing the environment too far out of balance. The causes of all of these things are variable. It could be possums, uh, there are insect diseases, um, the absence of regeneration is a major problem. You know, look at these Pahutakawa here for instance, they're all ancient trees. They haven't had a chance to regenerate be largely because of stock and grazing and trampling and fire and, and weed invasion, that sort of thing. So overall, if you look at the, at the country as a whole, um, a lot of the native vegetation is ageing and has lost its capacity to regenerate adequately. And that's what I'm saying is environmental stress. The answers are complex, but the search for those answers has been boosted with a recent visit. Clive Jones is a scientist with the New York Botanical Gardens, where he's been studying the effects of air pollution on the natural environment. Well, I think there's some fairly convincing evidence that the, for example, the, the major forest declines in Europe, in the, in the, in the Black Forest in particular, are, are due primarily to human uh, influences. Although there's still considerable debate over exactly 
what the mechanisms are that are, that are responsible, it looks as if they're associated with the acidification of soil from acid rain combined with the simultaneous fertilization of the soil uh, from the atmospheric deposition of nitrogen, which is another part of acid rain, but it acts like a fertilizer. While New Zealand may breathe easier in the belief that it's free from acid rain, Dr. Jones cautions that acid rain problems may well be here, although it's the result of quite different causes. The reason is when you dump fertilizer onto those pasture lands, um, one of the consequences is the soil becomes acidified gradually over many, many, many years, and at the same time you're adding fertilizer. Well, the European forests, uh, the end result may be very similar. The soil is acidified and there's fertilizer coming in, but the source of both the acidification and the fertilizer is acid deposition. Too much fertilizer plus unseasonably warm wet weather is also being linked to increased reports of illness in an exotic species of tree well established in this country. More commonly it's known as the Brazilian or American pepper tree. It's partly climatically controlled with heavy rainfall in the autumn in spring periods when fungal activity peaks twice yearly um, and if we get a lot of rain that can help stimulate the fungal activity. With any plant illness blaming just one or two apparent causes in isolation oversimplifies the problem and that's the major handicap with research into plant stress. Finding definitive answers could take many many decades and by that time it's likely to be too late. I think what we really need is to gain uh, a much better understanding of how um, uh, forest trees and, and agricultural crops as well respond to different forms of stress and, and, uh, and damage and figure out um, what are the sort of, what are the, characteristic, the characteristics of a, of a, of a pre-decline syndrome so that you then may be able to go to certain forests and look at them, measure certain things that you wouldn't normally think of measuring. Until that kind of understanding is reached, Philip Simpson advocates preemptive conservation steps to ease the stress on New Zealand's plant life. We have to take responsibility, you know, both nationally and regionally and locally, individually, to help restore the ecological health of the country. You know, it's in our interest to do so. It's right. not too late at all. report from Peter Stevens and edited by Philip Hurring. After the break, Jim has the weather prospects. And in business matters, our fastest growing export trade uses chips and bites to give our economy a big kick. recent visit to New Zealand by American economics guru Michael Porter caused something of a stir. One of his main themes was that our economy should rely less on butter and more on technology. In particular, Professor Porter focused on computer software as one of the industries that could lead us out of the economic doldrums. April Greenlaw reports. Charting construction of a new harbour in Algiers business systems for American communications giant AT&T, and cataloguing the vast collection of the art gallery of New South Wales. Behind them all, Kiwi know-how, computer software designed by New Zealanders. These success stories are all examples of homegrown technology finding export markets, and they're just what the doctor ordered when the doctor is Harvard University economist Michael Porter, whose prescription for New Zealand's economic health is less dependence on primary products like butter and more on technology. Some re-evaluations needed to be made of our traditional export markets, and I think that we've got tremendous um, potential in the software export arena. The returns are dramatically uh, higher than uh, any of our conventional commodity products. The total value of New Zealand's uh, overseas exports in software uh, are reckoned to be around $100 million today. So if you uh, translate that into, uh, say, dairy um, income terms, that would equate to around uh, $1 billion. But local investors are familiar with butter. Convincing them to back a product they can't even see has been a hurdle for developers. Many of them have been very frustrated at the lack of wider recognition of this. Um, 
I think particularly of uh, financial people who uh, are unwilling to back such uh, enterprises, mainly because they are dealing in products uh, that can't be seen or kicked or felt, but nonetheless uh, are capable of generating substantial cash flows. Some overseas venture capitalists like Canadian Ben Webster are seizing the opportunities here, pouring money into New Zealand software development. We've invested uh, myself and Helix, oh, three or four hundred companies. I'm in the startup game and uh, the people here, the cohesiveness, their intelligence, what they know, their understanding of where the world's going is uh, as good as anybody. We got good because we had no choice. Just as Kiwi mechanics earned an overseas reputation for excellence when cars were too expensive to replace, computer hardware has been so costly here, people have been forced to learn their machines inside out. There are now more than 600 software developers in New Zealand. Prompted by Porter, they're helping each other recognize their potential and could change New Zealand's export image. I think it's uh, quite a misconception uh, to think of us as simply uh, butter producers. April Greenlaw and the computer revolution. Staying with the high tech, here's Jim with the weather. Well, the computers have dished up a busy spring day tomorrow. A new high is growing off the Sydney coast. The current low with front attached will move away to the east tomorrow. And in between both systems, the wind will swing between westerly and southerly. So in the North Island tomorrow morning, no lows or fronts, just plenty of wind. In this case, a westerly bringing in scattered showers with fine periods. But the east and Wellington will stay fine. After lunch, it'll be more of the same. More westerlies with showers, but the Manama 2 will clear and a warm northwesterly will heat up the east coast. So 24s are expected tomorrow for the east coast cities. The South Island will get blown about two. Westerlies will bring showers up the west coast and also onto the mountains. A strong cool southerly will bring showers into Southland and Otago, but the weather will be fine between Nelson and Canterbury. In the afternoon, that southerly will push showers up into Canterbury. Elsewhere, more showers for the west, more fine weather for Nelson and Marlborough. Temperature highs for you tomorrow range between 14 and 22. On to the main centres now. A punchy westerly for Auckland, a few showers too, with a high of 20. Hamilton 19, again a fresh westerly and a handful of showers. Napier and Hastings fine and warm with 24. Windy 2, again from the west. Wellington also fine, this time with a nor'wester, the high 17. The southerly change for Christchurch with a few showers to dodge, the high 19. The Needham's high 16 tomorrow with that cooler southerly, you can expect some showers too. And that's the way it'll be on Wednesday. Showers will plague the west, sunshine will brighten the east. Thank you, Jim. Tomorrow, the Greenpeace ship Rainbow Warrior is due to arrive in Papaiti. The ship is on its way to Mururoa Atoll, but has not been cleared by the French authorities. Also in tomorrow's Perigo interview, Lindsay questions Winston Peters about his plans for the Waitangi Tribunal. Already its supporters believe the tribunal's under threat. I think the tribunal's days are numbered. That's tomorrow. Till then, good, good night. night.